What's wrong with LA Unified? Lack, lack of qualified teachers? What else? Distribution of money. Yeah. Political fragmentation. That sounds familiar. No. <laughs> what else? Overcrowding. Overcrowding. Yeah. When you hear about L Unified, what do you hear? Too much bureaucrats. What was over here? Poor facilities. What else? Well, okay, just not LA Unified. What is wrong with public education in America today? Since you've all been part of that. Low expectations. How about just too many tests in general? Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys hear that? Inability to deal with large immigrants coming in. What else? Not equal. Hmm. Yeah. Underpaid teachers. Under Underappreciated, underpaid, overworked. Hey, it's there. I'll well, get to you. Uh, he just asked me to fill in. The <laughs> school board members or teachers? I didn't hear. Teachers. No, not school board members. No, they're. <laughs> Who else? David. You think the system's perfect? Which you can, you can have that opinion. I don't know that much about it. Today. How about public education? You were, went through the public education system, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, what's wrong with it? It's perfect in Connecticut? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was great. Okay. Would you send your kid to public school? Yeah, definitely. You would? Yeah, so it's not just well, the conditions that they're in, but just the way they're designed and built. Yeah. Busing. Busing. Busing of what? For for overcrowding purposes or for? I went to Colorado, I went to my school, but I went there because it was overcrowded like Brandywine or Craig Mahon. Yeah. Race relations. Race relations. Okay. Yes? Economically segregated neighborhoods. Yeah. Well, the schools reflect that when they're neighborhood schools. Okay. Yeah. Kevin. Okay, that's kind of, the, yeah, lack of resources in general, but for especially in, in areas like that. Steve, what's wrong with uh, LA Unified? Two words. In addition to everything else you guys said, it's too big. Too big. Would, you're, it's impossible. You're, you can't do it. Well, you what's got, you what's got too big? 12,000 administrators. Cardinal Mahoney, who has 100,000 people in the Archdiocese schools, has 15 administrators. The district is so big, it can't deal with all the things you came up with. It's so wait a minute, you're impossible. saying that the LA Archdiocese schools are 100,000, mm -hmm. and LA Unified is 750,000, or mm -hmm. thereabouts. Yeah. So seven times larger. But Mahoney's only got 15 people, I think 18, and, right 18, and LA Unified's got 12,000? 12, 12, mm -hmm. oh. So here. Yeah, but Mahoney they, doesn't have to take the um, special ed's kid. They, take, they, do, they do a lot. There are a lot of things he doesn't have to do that, that, they, that they do have to do. But big school districts don't work anywhere. And small school districts work most places. Um, I know I was asking what's wrong. Maybe you turn the question around and ask what's right or what, what about these issues. But what's wrong and what's right? Wait, let me answer okay. what's right. Okay, two seconds. Parents love their kids. Parents are not sending their kids to schools. Say, oh, you go to public school because I don't care about you. Parents are, but half the parents who send their kids to LAUSD don't speak English as a primary language. And English is the only language taught in the schools. It's not the parents' fault. What's right is that everybody is well-meaning. What's wrong is it just doesn't, hasn't, won't, work because it's too big well is, is I think it too big yes I think it is too big but that doesn't mean that making it small is going to solve all our problems because you can have small but hostile you know sure. I think that that's a beginning though and I've worked for the district I worked for the district for 36 years and I do believe that it is too large 
but um, I think it's a false analogy to compare the, the archdiocese to the school district. You know, and Mahoney has something we don't have in the schools. He's and God. That's God. Yeah. <laughs> he's got the power. I mean, last night I went to church. He's, got, he's a constituent get, of one. I, I God. went to church to get ashes, and they had been giving ashes every half hour in the parish that I live in. It's a Catholic parish. But I would imagine that that, you know, experience was... Uh, all over the LA Unified. It doesn't especially. take God to fire a lousy teacher no. <laughs> or a lousy principal. Yeah. It almost he does. He does it, but they don't fire a lousy teacher or a lousy principal in LAUSD because it's too big. Maybe it does take God problems. to hire a fi fire. It does a. take God to hire, to fire a principal. No. But I think there are so many things that are also right with the schools. We accept every kid that comes to the door. Now, Catholic schools don't do that. Private schools don't do that and even charter schools, as much as we want to think they do, don't do that. I'm also working with a, a small charter school in the Valley that is a dual language. When it opens, and it's going to open this September, as a dual language, which is the most effective way of teaching uh, kids today. And yet, LA Unified has done very little with it because it doesn't fit into a nice little neat package, because you have to work hard, because you have to find the right teachers, and you have to be, and it's a new program, you know, there's no bulletins, there's no memos that are gonna tell you what to do. So, you know, what's right with the schools? They're there for everybody, and they are, the, one, the, the public school system is what's going to educate the future, the future of our children, the future of the society. I don't think that we're going to get there by creating small little tiny schools all over the place. It would be great if that could work because I believe in smallness, but I think that as we look to the future, we've got to look at the masses. And as many mistakes as, as the public schools make, I think we still have to work hard to make them work because they are our future. Mark? Right, wrong question? The right, right wrong question. Right, right, right. Well, I think it's important to separate out, which you guys did a little bit in your comments, what ails public education in America in general versus LAUSD as one particular school district, and what's sort of uniquely right or wrong with LAUSD. Um, there are 80 school districts in Los Angeles County. LAUSD is the largest by a gazillion times. The rest, with a few exceptions, are normal American school districts, which have one high school and its feeder schools. Santa Monica has two high schools, the district. Culver City District has one high school. Beverly Hills, one high school. Hacienda La Puente, a fairly large district, four high schools. So LAUSD is not of human scale, of appropriate local government scale relative to normal school districts. But that's always been true. I mean, that's what I struggle with, Steve. How, what, ha what was different? Did I just have a narrow blinder view looking at my parents' experience, my experience, my brother's experience, that we went to the one good school then and everything else was horrible? I don't think so. I, I think LAUSD was big and successful in an earlier time and was overwhelmed or has become overwhelmed by the challenge of race, immigration, and, and growth. So it may have been right size when things were different, but now not adept and nimble to confront the challenges that it, it faced. So I think it's a more nuanced thing than big, small. Compton, smaller school district, was taken over by the state. Oakland, smaller school district, taken over by the state. So the key variable I don't think is necessarily size, but I agree that LA Unified is more like a state in its scope than a local school district, and that probably needs to be, uh, to be looked at. Um, in terms of what's right, I mean, what's interesting is large urban districts like LA Unified set the tone and set the standard nationally for all kinds of innovations um, and all the challenges we faced. Both are true. I mean, it is so big that multiple things can happen. My son, who is with me tonight against his will, attends the Open School, which is an LA Unified is School. Is he the guy in, from in USC? Westchester. His no. brother's at USC. Oh, okay. His brother went to LA Unified. Open School, where Eli goes, LA Public School, best school I've ever seen, public or private. Unbelievable. And we could go visit, like, Locke High School in South LA, and I don't think you'd see a more troubling, dysfunctional environment, but both are LAUSD. It is so big that it is hard to sort of mush it all together 
and say good or bad. But in terms of innovations in dealing with bilingual education and serving kids with disabilities and developing new curriculum in the arts, where I work now um, at the Music Center, the Chicago Public Schools are developing an arts education program. They invited me to come out because they wanted to learn from the LA experience how they can do it in Chicago. So LA provides leadership in so many ways. Many of the bureaucrats who we think do nothing do incredibly important uh, and innovative work. But I do agree, I know Steve said it exactly this way, I think the kind of structure as it exists in 2007 is completely ill-equipped to morph and adjust to these challenges and we would be better served to decentralize to a much more radical extent and empower local communities. Last thing I would say is that in high performing districts, there's a kind of unity and affinity between community leaders and the school district. They talk with pride, we're doing something in San Marino, very affluent community, obviously different. In San Marino, there's a sense of civic pride with their schools, mayor, business leaders, chamber of commerce, homeowners. Those are our wonderful schools. We support them. We're in this together. We've lost that in LA Unified in the sense that we all are connected to LA Unified. It's all our big district, but everybody disowns it. There's not that sense of pride. Everybody likes from the mayor on up and down to sort of pretend that it's not our school district. It's some like alien body that's invaded our community. It's all messed up. It's all wrong. And without that sense, not that we should all be cheerleaders, but if the community and the school district are not kind of rowing in the same direction, you're really stuck in the water. And I think that's where LA Unified is right now. The civic elites, politically powerful people, businesses, labor, different groups, feel like LAUSD is the problem and it's not necessarily their job to fix it, it's just their job to tell everybody about the problem. And that bothers me and I think until we turn that around and start pulling together, we're just gonna see more conflict, more strife, more rhetoric, more finger pointing, but that doesn't really make things better for the kids. You know, the um, <clears throat> civic elite comment, though, I, I would make the argument that the civic elite really disengaged when the busing issue happened, and they wa didn't wanna get involved in that messy racial issue. And I think that with um, uh, Reardon and Steve, there was a re-engagement of the civic elite in terms of the passage of the bonds and all that. I think they're, they're complaining a little bit more than being supportive, but before you can get them even more involved, I think you have to let them vent to some extent. I, I really believe that one of the major changes of Valley Unified have been the re-engagement of the business community and the civic elite and many other uh, uh, civic players, nonprofits, than existed 20 years ago. Uh, um, I see that, I think that's, that's a, a big difference. I'm gonna ask the, have the students ask some questions, but let me ask you this one question, Mark, before that kind of taking the analogy of the archdiocese, if I were to make you cardinal of LAUSD with no school board, no election, I know you're not Catholic, but play along. Okay. I know a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, if, if you were to, uh, to do that, what would, what would you do your first day? What, what, would, what, what decisions would you make that you think could make a big difference? And then, I know you're not Catholic either, Steve, but we can convert you, but it, you, you then be Arch, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Cardinal. Uh, cardinal Slavkin? Well, there, there are a million things, and it's not a one-day thing. I, I, if I were king for a day or no, czar No, 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 Cardinal, not cardinal. king. I mean, cardinals have more power now. You wear a hat and stuff? I mean, yeah, you, a red hat? It's all, it's all very new to me. Um, it is my view that it is fundamentally a structural problem. So it's not about one new rule or one new policy. The overall structure is broken. We're trying to run, as, as Steve had mentioned, this huge, vast empire and, and this enormously diverse communities. There's a difference between Boyle Heights and Westchester. There's a difference between Chatsworth and San Pedro. There's a difference between Watts and Granada Hills. You can't run that sort of breadth and diversity of communities from headquarters. So the one thing that I would push for, and, and, and have pushed for for a long time, is to decentralize governance. It's sort of a version of the neighborhood councils, but with more sort of real teeth. But schools in Westchester should be governed by parents and teachers and administrators in Westchester, and just because we're in Westchester. And so if we had a problem or concern at Westchester High or Orville Wright Middle School or Loyola Village Elementary or whatever, we shouldn't have to go downtown to petition for sort of relief. There should be a meeting you know, at the middle school library over here across from Vaughn's on 80th Street. 
where people in this community or any other community come and see these are our schools, these are our kids, and we have an issue, a challenge, whatever it is. We need to empower people to do that. The charter school movement is in part a, a, a desire for that kind of self-governance, of autonomy, of self-determination. And rather than pick off one charter at a time, one here, one here, one here, if it's the right idea to give people local control, which I think it is, then it needs to be a systemic shift across the entire LAUSD and push it not to like sub-regions and bureaucracy, you know, the whole valley or whatever, to the unit of one high school and its feeder schools, those little clusters. That's a normal school district in this country. If we empower, it's not a magic bullet. How many high but schools do we have in LA units? We used to have 49 like, for a long time. 50 some? Yeah, it's 50 some, some approaching 60. Yeah. They yeah. broke ground yesterday in the east side on, on a new one. I mean, they're building new schools. But that's where people's kids are, that's where they live, that's where they care, and that's where you can make a difference and feel that your voice can be heard. When you aggregate people into a massive system and say, what one rule should you try to put forth to decide you know, how to best teach math across 800 schools, I just believe that maybe not the same exact right answer in every single school. There are local differences, there are differences in teachers and their philosophy, there are different cultures in schools, that within a framework of results and accountability, we've got to free people to have a sense of control, and we've lost that. There's been a centralization where everything needs to flow up the bureaucracy, and that's just not a good way to run any enterprise, but particularly schools. So that idea of what I would call radical decentralization. Radical would, decentralization, that's would a great be the term. One thing I that would sounds say. like a midterm kind of question, radical decentralization. Anyway, Cardinal Soboroff, you heard Cardinal Slavkin, what would you do? I would defer to him, I think he... No, Cardinals don't defer. Okay, okay we're gonna have to take away that hat Jewish right away. Jewish Cardinal defers. <laughs> well, I think what you said was, was exactly right, and I would add to it, because remember you're gonna save two and a half billion dollars a year by decentralizing, because those 12,000 people who work in the administration, not the teachers, uh, make $2 billion a year. I take some of that and I would train, the, get the best and the brightest programs around the country to train each of these 60 principals, but I would change their name to mini superintendents, uh, that doesn't sound good. Who wants to be a mini superintendent? I would call them superintendents. I'd call them whatever. Like a mini mart or something like that. And I would train them in business practices, education practices, give them all this training and give them the money and let them do it. Okay. Maria, the Pope won't let me make, let you be a cardinal. So we'll make you a Well, they have queen, the no queen. women thing. So yeah. yeah. Right. They've got to fix that. Change they do. Um, zone of choice. You know, Mark is talking about... Um, um, an organization around clusters, of feeder patterns, if you will, of because uh, families have kids in different levels of schools, and you know, elementary, middle school, and high school. I was a, a cluster administrator, and I think even today, um, people look back on those days, and this was what 10, 12 years ago, uh, as one of the most innovative. And I'm glad that you were on the board at the time and voted for it. Um, we had 27 uh, most innovative way of governing the, the large bureaucracy like we have in LA Unified because we had 27 clusters. Most of the clusters had uh, two schools or one school depending on, on the size. I had San Fernando High School. At that time it had almost 5,000 students. It still almost has almost 5,000 even though a couple of new schools have opened up. And um, we had 14 elementary schools, had about 24,000 students. And I would go to meetings and I would tell people, I have about you know, 20 schools and, and I have 24,000. Oh, that can't be right. Oh, yes, it can. When your elementary schools are over 1,000. Wow. I, I used to work at Ella Huntington Park High, um, Middle School way in, on, on the other side of uh, the district. And one day I had to deliver something to the elementary school which was Miles Elementary. I don't know if you know that end of the district was the largest elementary school. It had 2,400 kids. In the country. In the country. And I think today it's Union, but in those days it was Miles. And I was delivering something to the middle, to the office, and I saw this line of kids going around the building and around the other building and around another building. And they had these little patches with their name and their, and their room number and their teacher. On, uh, uh, pinned to their back. And I said, what are these kids doing? 
must, uh, you know, are they getting immunizations or something? I thought it was a special day. Oh no, it's just lunchtime. We have 700 kindergartners and we're always losing them. And I thought to myself, you know, how many parents would want to send their kindergartner to a school with that many little kids? So that, that's part of our problem. But, <laughs> and, and so, you know, in those days we hadn't yet built the schools that we are now building in that part of the district. But I want to talk about the Belmont zone of choice because next Tuesday the Board of Education has to vote on this. And what it means is that when you look at the Belmont High School area, and we work in Belmont High School, I just did a big teacher training there a few months ago, we are now opening five other schools in high schools in that area. Belmont has about 5,000 or even more than 5,000 students. And now we've got opening up new the 450 North Grand, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, probably will be called Eli Broad <laughs> School, <laughs> the Arts High School. And we've got a new one on 3rd Street, Miguel Contreras, a labor leader. And then we're opening up Civitas, which UCLA is, is helping uh, to open up, a small other high school. And so now the schools, the kids who live in that area are all in walking distance, you know, in that community. Now, who's going to be left in the old Belmont High School that was just like the one that you were describing? You know, it was, it's, it's ugly. It's probably one of the ugliest schools in the city. The campus is the tiniest little campus for the amount of kids that go to that school. And it's, it's so neglected. And everyone's trying to help it. So we, they came up with this idea of anyone who lives in that area can choose to go to any of those schools. Because we don't want to cream off the best kids, you know, the most motivated kids to go to the new schools, and the best teachers, by the way. And then you leave Belmont High School and even you know, worse condition than it is today. So we're coming up with what we call the Belmont Zone of Choice. Do you know that it's taken almost two years for the school district to decide to let us do that for Belmont? And this is just a little mm -hmm. tiny you know, corner of Fernando the Fernando asked the question about, and Mark talked about it too, in other areas, the community, the business people, the, the leaders of the community, we're proud of our schools, we're this, we're that. Okay. How many of you if there was a specific class and you saw it on TV and said, you know what, there's 20 kids in this class and they need pencils. They need pencils in the worst way. How many of you would reach into your pocket and take money and get pencils for those kids? Yeah. How many of you would send the money instead of getting the pencils and giving them to the kids send the three bucks to LAUSD. <coughs> Why not? Why wouldn't you? Because the pencils wouldn't get in the schools, would they? Where, well, you know where it goes, into 12,000 administrators down. So I sit on the board of the Weingart Foundation. We, our assets are a billion dollars. We give away $40 million a year today. Today comes in, I, so I dressed up, nothing personal. I no, we, up for this anyway. we, we like, you give us, okay. you give Loyola So today I went to a, a, lot of money, I so went we, to a meeting, and, um, and one of the applications was an application for um, pencils, some playground stuff, which is a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so the board members are saying, wait a minute, of course we'll give the money for the playground stuff, but we're not going to give it to LAUSD. Because you give it to LAUSD, the playground ain't going to get built because it takes them two years to figure out. It's not that the, the board members are bad. They're good people. It, the system is broken. It's too big. It can't function like this. So are most of the issues because of its so the big So the big timers, all these people that you want to participate in LAUSD are all carving off little programs for their own. One's got this brochure, one's got that brochure, Eli's doing this one, and Bill Syart's doing that one, and they're just all pulling things away from LAUSD. So, I mean, problem. just to give you the uh, sense of the size of LA Unified, there are more school, school children in LA Unified than there are people in the whole city of San Francisco, right? The so size- In the whole state of Delaware. In the I mean, whole state of Delaware. 
And we have signs in the whole state of Alaska. <laughs> and we have signs on the outside of these schools that say, come on in. We don't care about you. Because if they cared about them. I've never seen that sign. Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> Because if they cared about them, the bathrooms wouldn't be so dangerous right. that the kids can't go in. If they cared about them, there would be pencils. If they cared about them, the ceilings wouldn't be falling in. The, the system is so big that they cannot function and do that. The budget of LA Unified is bigger than the combined GMP of all of Central Amer all the six Central American countries. What is the budget of LAOSD? Seven billion? Nine, no, bigger. Ten billion? Nine. No, Ten? It's, nine. it's nine. nine billion for operations. Yeah, one it's billion. I'm, billion. I'm off by a couple of okay. billion so dollars. So let's what say not, wait, wait. nine billion for operations, okay? Yeah. So how much is that a student? These are social scientists. They can't do that math real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's can I, I just want to add one piece, because I... Did you have more. the answer of the division of a billion and 750? No, $10,000 a student. Yeah. When Steve strays a little bit rhetorically, I just feel the need to, to jump in. I think the, the problems, the challenges that exist are not the creation of the district. They are many of the things that all of you mentioned. And there is a historic challenge of trying to be a point of entry for an immigrant population on this kind of scale. It is fairly unprecedented in the history of the world. We kind of joke about it. Well, there are only 92 languages spoken in the school. Steve said half the parents don't speak English. You know. As if, well, like every other district's figure that out. What's wrong with these bozos? I mean, it is really a historic challenge to overlay poverty, immigration, and language, put it in a community that sort of walked away in terms of civic involvement, and, and, and amazing things are happening every day. And you know, elementary test scores are rising consistently and so on. So the fundamental problem, as I said, I think it's structural. I think the challenges, many of them are external, and we need a new structure to grapple with it. I just want to disagree with Steve, because I think you're being a little bit cartoonish in the way you're portraying it. It is the kind of boogeyman that it's just like too many bureaucrats who are wasting money. But there are too many bureaucrats, aren't there? Well, compared to what? I'm not sure that that's true. And the amount of money, we go through this every budget cycle. The, the teachers union says, you could give us the raise we want, if you just got rid of the bureaucrats, you'd have more than enough money. Never been true, not true today. They just agreed to a new salary agreement with the teachers, a 6% increase this year, which you know, one could argue teachers deserve. And they're gonna have to find $200 million in cuts um, or budget adjustments or whatever. The too many, too few bureaucrats thing, it's just a total distraction. It is not a significant material issue in dealing with the future of the city or the future of education. Again, we could talk about it, and we could look at cuts and stuff. I just think it's sort of a cartoonish boogeyman answer to say they got 12,000. So you'd leave the 12,000 and then, and then distribute power to all the schools. Then what do the 12,000 do? Well, our bus drivers bureaucrats if they're budgeted centrally? Our food services who prepare more meals than any other enterprise except the Army every day are those bureaucrats. We have 350 arts teachers who travel to the schools teaching music and dance and theater and nope. so on but they're housed downtown, that's where their payroll code is, are those bureaucrats. Yeah. Our itinerant school psychologists who do assessments of kids and serve kids with disabilities mm -hmm. who are housed out of central office, are those bureaucrats? Is the mental health office downtown, are those bureaucrats? Are the guys finding property and building new schools? Well, it's like, well, no, those are, we need those. No, we need but what those, about the 11,000 others that you didn't mention? Those I don't are. That's, I just think that's bogus, Steve. Then why do they pay $11 for a stapler buying bulk through this huge procurement system when I can go to Office Depot and buy it for $3. Schools can go to Office Depot and use a credit card oh, and, do sure. it, and do it and Okay. Do it I mean, uh, teachers pay see. for it because they're at, no, because no. the district doesn't deliver. Steve, the district has empowered. Did you pay for stuff? When you, why not? Why did you pay for it? I'm not saying out of your own pocket. Well, but she did. Because, why did she? <laughs> because the district hey, didn't provide. I'm the moderator here. I <laughs> ask the questions. <laughs> You want action? Listen. You asked for yeah. us to come. No, hey, I just uh, think turn off his mic. We're class. dealing with a kind of urban right. mythology right. as opposed to, there are enough facts to argue about right. and enough fact problems to right. not overlay a right. kind of like urban myth. My friend's sister's cousin told me that it cost a million dollars to buy a copyright. It's like, well, that's just, when you investigate this stuff, it tends not to pan okay. out okay. and not be exactly okay. as Okay, as Steve, one more word. I get one more thing. And okay. Steve okay. is otherwise I'm right on everything. I'm sitting on the BB committee. 
and the bureaucrats are telling me, here's what we need to do to all these schools, and we voted $3.2 billion. So in walks Karen Bass, who's now an assemblywoman, with a group called The Coalition, that's now one of your sponsors, <laughs> with 30 kids, 30 students, in tears, showing pictures of their schools, with the bath, path I mean, pathetic pictures, okay? Expecting us to say, well, um, that's just too bad, you know, I mean, it's just the way, and we're gonna, okay? So what did we do? We said, you know what, tell us, bureaucrats, how do you determine what that money should be spent for? Nobody would say, well, we don't, well, how do you determine, wait a minute, you guys just said there's $350 million worth of asphalt that needs to be put in there? Who determined that? So we go back through the system, and what they did is they took all the school properties, took the buildings out, and then said this is what's left, and we got to put new asphalt in. What about grass? What about this? What about th So we said to those students, now wait a minute, stop for a second. If you will take on as a project and go to 50 schools and you tell me what's wrong with those schools, don't let these bureaucrats tell me what's wrong with these schools. You tell me what's wrong. You ask the parents and you ask the janitors what's wrong. That's what I want to know about. And we'll put the money aside. And you know what? We got lists of 50 schools. And you know what? We put $180 million aside. Questions? Nicole, right here. This is kind of for everyone on the panel. Um, there's a lot of talk about decentralization and you know making it smaller, having kind of neighborhood councils run the schools. But what about um, more central, like the centralization of curriculum? Like I, both my aunts are teachers in LAUSD, and my dad was a teacher, and he's an administrator now in LAUSD. And um, Open Court has been, they say, really, really good for the test scores. And it, even though it does centralize everything, as you go through the different levels of school. Um, Everyone's learning the same thing. Do you think that that is necessary to decentralize too? Like you were saying, um, Mr. Slatkin? Well, because I, I think it's uh, I'll kind take of that important. one on. <laughs> and, so, and you mentioned open court? Yeah, open Can court you, is the reading. Describe open court for it's the, it's the managed reading instruction is what it is. It's a, it's a prescriptive program that is used in, in all schools that are not reading at grade level. It's not used in all schools, only those schools that are reading below grade level. And so um, managed instruction, I, you know, a centralized curriculum has done, when you put that much in emphasis and that much training and that much money into a program, you're going to see some gains. And I think that we've seen that happen, especially in the early, uh, the first four or five years of implementation, because it's only been around for about five, six years. What we're seeing now, and you have to look at the data, and you have to look deep into the data, not just surface, but what's happening to the subgroups. You know, are all um, groups learning? Are they all learning at the same rate? I say no. If you look at the data, the data tells us that open court is not a helping students who don't have a strong um, English background, you know, in their home and where they come from and maybe only hear English during the six hours they're in school. Uh, it, is, it is helping them to decode. It is helping them to uh, read if you think reading only means decoding. Because be when they get into the fourth and fifth grade, when the curriculum starts getting harder and you need to understand and manipulate language and comprehend, you're no longer learning to read, but you're reading to learn, then you see that uh, managed instruction, you know, one size fits all, does not work for all kids. Just to, you're, it's a great question. And, and in my idea of this radical decentralization, it's kind of like the United States Constitution. You've got to sort out what is decided centrally, because there still will be some things, um, and what should ought to be dis decided at this cluster level that we talked about, at the, at the, at the neighborhood level. And I think curriculum, can fall somewhere in the middle, and that if, if you're in public school, what you learn, what you're expected to come away with in skills and knowledge, I think should be fairly centralized or consistent. You shouldn't have communities saying, we, we're not into math, so we just don't teach math. That's not our thing. Um, that's not okay. Um, 
and yet at a certain level kind of operationally in the classroom, teachers need to have ownership about what they do. Not every teacher doing their own thing, but they've got to buy into it. You could have a great program that's tested in the laboratory. If teachers aren't with the program and really invest in making it work, it may not work. So you can't separate out the people doing it from, from the curriculum. So I think that falls in the middle of curriculum guidelines, of instructional benchmarks, of pacing guides, of all these kind of tools for making curriculum come alive. We've got to sort through how much flexibility locally. So I'm not for everybody to do whatever they want. But I think basically to foster that kind of ownership and really to solve problems, to Steve's point. The people who know the condition of the bathroom at Orville Wright Middle School are the kids or, and, and teachers and people who are there every day. The people said, oh, we did an inspection two years ago and the window wasn't broken. Well, that's probably true, but it's broken now because we were there today. And to hear that you'll come out in a month to look at it doesn't let us solve our own problems. So, um, some kind of guidelines of consistency for curriculum, but empowering people locally. I'm just a big believer in giving people in any field, including schools, obviously, a sense that they can control their destiny. I have uh, two questions. The first one, I'm gonna stick with the same theme we're talking about. Um, uh, I know you're talking about decentralizing, but I, I, there, I felt like there was a little bit of a contradiction when you were talking about civic pride and kind of the mayoral pride of, uh, of our school systems. And I know the mayor has, um, there's a big talk about the mayor coming in and taking control of LA Unified School District. And I was just wondering how you guys felt about this subject, given that I know the mayor was a historical friend of yours. And, He's just wrong, but I love I, him. I, I, I was under the impression that I know that all of you guys are going to think that this is wrong, but I'm curious as to what you feel like the, the negative impacts of this would be if he is successful in taking over this, the school district. And the second question? The second question is about funding. And um, uh, money is such a problem with our school systems today. And um, it's obvious that the schools haven't been able to grow with um, our society and with Los Angeles, the way that our, our, our city is growing with the immigrant population. And um, uh, when you look at schools like Brentwood and Beverly Hills, it's obviously not as big a problem as it is in other areas of Los Angeles, and that is because of money, obviously. And so I'm just wondering what you guys would see as a reimagining of how to mobilize funds for the schools that so desperately need it. Um, property taxes obviously aren't happening. Uh, the parents aren't really going to come in and donate like they would in Brentwood and Beverly Hills. So how would you guys suggest to mobilize those funds to get the, the pencils and books and papers so the teachers don't have to buy them. Like my sister who's a teacher that, that does end up getting, getting them out of pocket, which isn't an urban myth, but an actual fact of what's going on. So uh, let, let's take uh, one at a time, mayoral control. Steve, good idea, bad idea? You supportive of this? Um, I think Antonio's original, original plan was better than the one that he wound up supporting. Um, I think that it... How about just in general, the idea that the mayor ought doesn't to doesn't matter. It's too big. It's too big. But if you had one executive as opposed to just the uh, legislative branch? No. There's, nobody, there's nobody in the world qualified to run that thing. It's, it doesn't work. In it doesn't New, work. New York City has, has, I mean, part of Antonio's fascination with it is like the other big city mayors, New York, Chicago in particular, the other two largest cities, the school district has been reformulated as a department of city government. So in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg appoints the school chancellor, uh, Klein, Joel Klein, who's like a city department head. Right. And it used to be called the Board of Education, now it's called the Department of Education, it's a city department. In Chicago, the same thing. Arne Duncan, they call CEO, works directly for the mayor, it's a city department. So you have this mayor control in a, in a kind of pure sense. And if we were in New York today or Chicago, we'd be having the exact same conversation. It's just too big. Teachers are paying out of their own pocket. They have the problem of immigration. What about parents? What about gangs? The schools are falling apart. So the notion that it's a panacea, I think there's kind of a romantic notion of the heroic executive on a white horse who that'll solve it. I haven't seen evidence 
that the issues about achievement in, in, in K-12 schools has anything to do with the mayor control thing. Antonio, God bless him, I think could have made the argument that mayoral control like New York or Chicago should be given a chance. But he compromised with himself within 10 minutes of announcing that, and the first compromise he made in Sacramento is, okay, so we'll leave the elected school board in place, comma, and I was like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? I mean, now we got the worst of all worlds. You can make a case for mayor control. You can make a case for the school district to be a separate entity, which is what we have now. You can't make a case for what about a muddled, complicated, mushed, blurred accountability model where that, everybody's in charge. It? He, he, called it a, he called it a victory. <laughs> he declared victory. He just needed a bill to get people off his back. But the reality is this proposal, which the courts have held up, would make things worse by just adding more people mucking around and nobody's really in, in, so, in control. The second, and I love the guy, by the way. I mean, love the guy, hate the plan. Um, on the funding issue, we haven't talked about Proposition 13 in California, which was enacted in 1978, broke the historical connection between local property taxes and school funding. And that's true in, in most of the United States. So now, all schools in California, all districts in California, are dependent upon Sacramento, the state legislature, to decide how much money they get. So big year in state revenues, people are pro-education, you get a surge in school funding. We're experiencing that this current year. But then we read in the paper yesterday or yeah. something, the state legislative analyst says, whoops, we got a shortfall of $2 billion, maybe a deficit next year. So local school districts are on this roller coaster in terms of funding right now, up one year, down the next. And local property taxes and local tax payers are not part of the equation in the sense that people in this neighborhood are not going to determine or have a say on funding for their schools next year. The legislature will or will not give them more money, and we're just watching. School boards are watching. Parents are watching. Homeowners are watching. If local districts have to go before the voters and say, agree to raise your property taxes beyond the bonds, which we've done, but to help pay for the operations of our schools, then you really get people coming out to meetings and getting engaged and paying attention. So we've let public schools in California slip away from being a kind of mainstream middle class entity to becoming like a welfare institution. It's like the King Drew Hospital of Education is the public schools. And that just bothers me that people say there's no way I'd send anyone I love to that. You know, the poor people need schools, so I'm not against it. But I would never send somebody I care about to those schools, nor would I give them money, nor would I vote for, for giving them more money. When you break that nexus between the kind of voting community and the schools, you're at risk. And I worry that LAUSD is there right now. So the mayor's thing, while it's a cockamamie Michigan bill that got approved, to the extent it reconnected the city and people with the schools, there might be some benefit there. But generally, I think it's a mess. Maria. Well, I think... Um <laughs> I agree to a certain extent. Which, what, which part, uh, the muckety well, well, or the... Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> what, what I like about what Antonio did was that he brought passion. He put it square right in front of everybody's eyes. This is, you know, his number one issue was education. And he did bring, he, he shed a light on something that really needed to be um, put on, on, on what's ailing uh, LA Unified Education. However... When you start looking at, you know, what kind of a, what kind of data, what kind of evidence is coming out of the schools, out of the districts that have had mayoral control, you look at Chicago and New York City and Boston, and they're very different. They're very small. Boston is about 100,000 kids. We have 700,000 and more. Um, maybe uh, New York City, it has over a million, about a million three. But still, New York City, Boston, and Chicago are all one city. We have 26 cities within our district. And not only that, um, the boundaries of the city in those other cities are also contiguous with the boundaries of what their county um, um, systems look like. So in other words, the health system for New York is a state health system. So the nurses that work in the schools in New York City are really state health nurses. So it's very different. Um, I'm very proud of the fact my last job with LA Unified was in charge of health and health services. And we have, um, even today, we have 600 nurses serving our schools. It's not enough, 600, where well, we have 822 schools. But we have more nurses in LA County 
does in uh, public health nurses. So wait a minute, there are more nurses at more LA, nurses Unified LA Unified than, than the LA, LA County, County public health system. Health, public health nurses. Hmm. Not, not the ones working in hospitals, no, right. but the ones that are dealing with community issues. And so, you know, it's very hard. I think the mayor took on, I, I, I call it his Iraq. I think that this issue is going to be his Iraq issue. He went in, I think, almost naively thinking that he could do what maybe others have done. And yet, what others have done is not that great. And yet, when he got into this issue, my gosh, it's very different than working with um, So why, why, city. why did he get into this issue, Maria? Why, why do you think he because did this? Because I think that he's very passionate about education and because of his own experience of being a dropout or a, being kicked out, actually, of a private school and then being um, resurfacing again as a student at Roosevelt High School. And I think that he um, feels that if he hadn't had that second chance that the public schools gave him, where would he be today? Steve, why did Antonio do this? Every mayor's done it. Uh, Reardon was very passionate about it. He went through this same processes, brought the business community, did this, did that. Um, uh, you know, mayors do it. It's a, it's a huge issue, and I think that he is a compassionate guy, and he sees that he's a, you know, he's a rock star, and everybody listens to him and watches him, so he figures, why not use some of my, um, some of my um, assets um, to try, and, to try and, and, and help? And I think that that's, I think but that's there, good. But there's a... You had joked about promises earlier. The fact that Antonio spent much of his career engaged in public education, as I said, he worked for the, the, the teachers, teachers Union. Union. I mean, he is just deeply personally committed. For him, it's an issue of social justice. It's an issue of creating opportunity for kids who he sees a lot like he was when he was young. He has enormous credibility on the issue. He did not need a bill in Sacramento to say, you have a legitimate interest in education. And I think left his best devices, he wouldn't have. And he would have been now a year and a half into an unbelievable partnership with the school district. But when he was running for, the, for mayor against Jim Hahn and against Bob Hertzberg, and they had all kinds of forums. We had a forum here one day. Yeah, we had a forum here. Um, Part of the lecture series. They were playing right a game of one-upsmanship on public education. And Bob Hertzberg, if you guys remember, was saying, hmm. I will break up LA Unified and had these commercials with him kind of walking around like Godzilla smashing the buildings, if you remember that. And Jim Hahn, who had never really been vigorous on the education issue, finally saw the light in the heat of an election campaign and all the polls or whatever, and said, well, if I'm elected, I will appoint two members to the LA school board. People are like, whoa, that was kind of an interesting idea. <laughs> Mr. Viragosa, what about you? And it's interesting is until that time with Hertzberg and Hahn kind of pushing, Antonio was not making that his centerpiece issue at all. And not, he was always pro-education. He was not running for mayor on an education platform. But Hertzberg pushing the issue, Hahn then jumping on board, and Antonio made a think almost off the top of his head calculation in the heat of a forum, as Steve and I know what that's like sometimes. He said, well, if I'm elected, I'll take over the whole school district. He's like, woo! That's <laughs> true. And he got elected. And I think he would have just as well said, you know, I didn't really mean that literally and move on. But the LA Times editorial page from like the day one, so what about it? When are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? And I think Antonio has been feeling this pressure that until I go to Sacramento and somehow show that I'm going to fight for this, they will attack me as being, you know, hypocritical, false promises, and other, you know, false campaign promises. So I think he felt, I don't know if I rack's the analogy, he had to get this thing like off his back. And that's why I worry he was too quick to get a bill. Instead of saying, I'd rather have no bill than a bad bill, it's like, I've got you know, three more weeks in the legislature, this is like a year ago. The clock's ticking, we gotta get a bill out of here, you know, let's just do it. And he, um, for whatever reason, I think agreed to a series of these stupid compromises to come up with a bill that's neither fish nor fowl, doesn't give him control over anything, makes matters worse, brings more kind of these small city mayors to start mucking around. The, There's the that word district. again. His favorite word is muck. <laughs> mucking around. No, I, it's not a personal... For example, Marta Scudia is a former state senator, terrific woman. I like her. She represents the southeast cities, Huntington Park, Bell Bell Gardens. These communities have felt kind of forgotten by LEUSD. 
she had a key vote. Antonia needs her vote to get the bill out of the Senate Education Committee or wherever it was. She says, the only way I'm going to vote for this bill is if the mayors of like Bell, Cudahy, and Huntington Park get to decide who is the LAUSD local superintendent for this particular office, which is just like, what? They say, well, get your vote? Yes. Okay, we'll take that amendment. Any objection? Hearing none, the amendment is in the bill. And we're making law and we're setting the future of LA Unify. We're deciding who gets to pick one particular local superintendent because we needed her vote to get it out of committee. And that's how this bill was kind of assembled with a series of compromises to say we got, it, we got a bill. But the sad reality is the bill doesn't give him control and the bill makes matters worse. And I'm just hoping that the courts will strike it down for good and he can move on and the LA Times will let him move on. Say, so I tried the bill, you saw that got struck down. Now I would like to work in true partnership with the school district Is it too late though? to attack the dropout problem, to make it safe for kids to walk to school, to base safety around our schools, to bring arts and cultural, you know, whatever it is. He could be working now in a proactive way to make things better like no one else in the city, but instead, if you read the paper, today's feud was like he'll meet with the superintendent, but he won't meet with the school board president in the same meeting. And so it starts to seem really kind of petty and more about ego than it's about making things better. So I'm just hoping that he can remove himself from that kind of quandary and move on. We need his leadership. He can do it better than anyone, but it's like, let's get to work already. I don't want his legacy to be as, as four years of mayor. I was the guy who got a bill that was struck down by the court. Like, Whoa, good for you. You know, that's really something future generations of kids will cherish, that you were the guy who got a bill that was struck down by courts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want him to have a real legacy of stuff to point to that is really helping real kids who need him so much. I actually have two questions. Um, what about the school board? I know there's a new measure on the ballot to make it full time, and Marilyn, Marilyn Diamond is trying to make the pay equal to that of a city council person. And the second question is, um, what about Superintendent Brewer? Because on Saturday, he's speaking at our African American Alumni Association. He's a keynote speaker. He lives at Playa. He lives in Playa. Yeah. Huh? Did you give him a discount? Huh? Cool. <laughs> well, what, what advice would what you give? You... What advice would you give the superintendent in dealing with Antonio and dealing with the school board and dealing with the teachers union? What five things would you tell him to do, and how would he do it? Move to Playa Vista. Well, no, move to Playa Vista. <laughs> <laughs> he did. The the charter amendment, which is like L, is it L? It's, uh, it's on the ballot on March 8th, right? It would impose term limits for school board for the first time, which the school board has never really needed term limits because people tend to leave voluntarily with the exception of <laughs> one of my dear Julie co Kornstein. colleagues, Julie Kornstein, who is in her 20th year as a school board member, oh if you can believe that. Um, anyway, term limits of 12 <laughs> years. I'm against term limits, but I don't see that's a big problem. Campaign finance limitations for school board elections which I think are actually long overdue. Uh, there are no limits currently. So the teachers union, when I was running, the law limited the teachers union to $5,000 contribution to me, which they did. And then beyond that, we had to raise checks from individual teachers, and they were mostly $10 and $15 checks. But that was the process. Now, today, there are no limits. So UTLA is gonna give multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to Marguerite Lamott and John Lauritsen, who are running for re-election. And that's just, I mean, they're nice people, but when you accept multiple hundred thousand dollars from any single source, you can't really be independent. And on the other side, the mayor and his folks can pump in unlimited money. So this would put limits of how much you can give, which I think is a good idea. And then lastly, it actually doesn't raise the pay. It's what politicians do when they get near the pay issue is they appoint a commission to study the pay issue and decide so they won't be blamed for raising the salaries. So that's what this would do, appoint a commission that would study the salary of school board members and decide every like five years or something what that salary should be. I gotta think they'll bump it up from 24,000, which is long overdue. I'm not sure it should be full time. I mean, it gets back to my point about centralization. Wherever the elected officials are in a system, mm -hmm. that's where the political power flows. That's like a law of physics. If you have elected school board members meeting every Tuesday downtown, that's where the power and authority is gonna flow. So my idea of this radical decentralization, I don't think we'll ever get it off the ground if the power is held by seven elected members downtown. So more full time, more stature and all that for school board. As a former board member, I'm sympathetic, but that might create more centralization and more politics in a way. Um, 
and, and, and not less. And for Brewer, I think he's a great guy. I haven't had a chance to get to know him really or spend uh, time with him. My, my one answer, which I think he gets, is be strong. The city needs you more than you need the job. Don't get in the habit of deferring to everybody and being afraid of your own shadow and counting tea leaves on the school board. Lead, be bold, and people will respect that. Superintendents get into trouble when they become really wussy and are afraid of, if I do this, he'll get mad. If I do this, she'll get mad, and then nothing happens. We need, Roy Romer, I think, was a bold leader. Sure I think we was. need more bold leadership. I hope that, that Brewer will, will yeah. be that way. So, um, remember, guy. I hope you guys are taking notes because we're going to have a vocabulary test on wussy, muck, and all those kind of words. That. Uh, uh, what? What is? Uh, a Meshigata. Yeah. Do they know it? That's a Yiddish term. Yeah. Maria, what would you advise Superintendent Brewer? I think he needs to get out of the four fifth of the three thirty North Brand or Beaudry. Not Brand, or Beaudry. Beaudry. <laughs> we move from from Brand to Beaudry. He needs to get out, and he needs to talk to communities, uh, and not just listen to you know third or fourth hand uh, advice. Uh, get out to see the schools. Th this city is is a, a microcosm of the world. You know, I, I I drive from Olympic Boulevard, where all the Korean, the strong Korean community, and the schools there, and you move over into Pico Union, where it's Central America. You know, not, not Mexico, but Central America, Guatemala and El Salvador. In fact, we have more El Salvadorian students, uh, I think, than the city of San Salvador um, <laughs> in, our, in our schools uh, around um, the Belmont area. And then you get to the valley, and it's a different place. And the valley is changing, too, West L.A. And then Huntington Park, it's all part of the district. And I'm not sure that someone coming from the outside, I'm not sure that, that uh, Romer ever really got out into the communities. In fact, I think that's one of the criticisms that many of the communities had, that he didn't you know, get down with la gente, you know, the people. But he was a bold leader, and I think that this gentleman, I haven't met him yet, but I think um, he got the strike settled in a timely way. That could have disrupted the entire school year. And whatever you know, his role was in that, it was a success. And I think that so far, you know, we're, we're waiting to see if he has any innovative plans, if he has, I think he's, he's not an educator. So you know, he's, he's got a, a learning curve. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll see some good things happen. Steve, what would you tell, besides, okay, he took your number one suggestion, move to Playa Vista. Move to Playa, yeah. yeah. I did that, yeah. Yeah, I've met him a couple times. Um, we're at the coffee bean? All over the place. Uh, I agree that Ro I thought Romer was terrific. I think that because he understood the politics, he un um, I would I would say to to him, and I might just call him on the way home and tell him um, to listen to students, not politicians; to listen to teachers, not bureaucrats; to listen to parents, not lobbyists, because the politicians, the bureaucrats, and the lobbyists are screwing up this school system. And it's, he is getting spun, you know what getting spun means, right? Spun dizzy by the politicians, by the bureaucrats, and by the lobbyists. And it takes a special kind of guy to know how to shine those guys off and get down to it. And when those kids come in there, and they come in there and show what's wrong with those schools, it's got to make them angry. And he can't listen to the bureaucrats say, well, sir, we're on that, and we're doing a study, and we're having another study. And he's got to see through it like Romer did. No, we need to discuss. We've got to record it. OK. Well, um, I, I have kind of an advantage in that I technically went to an inner city school in Long Beach. Uh, and I, and I, I grew up in, in Montana. Okay, wait a minute. You grew up in Montana, but went to school in Long Beach. Well, up until Busing. about up until oh, ninth grade, you know. So, <laughs> I tell you, I mean, in Montana, we don't we don't have we didn't have computers in our classrooms. We didn't have big screen TVs in every classroom. The school I felt like the school in Long Beach was overfunded, personally, and you know when when we had problems in Montana with our test scores, you know. They, they brought all the kids in, and they spent about 10 minutes talking about money and three hours yelling at us, blaming the kids, blaming the students, 
You know, and I respect what you said, Maria. I mean, you know, the politicians got to get in there. You just got to yell at these people and tell them to get their acts together. You know, because that's how many really kids, that's what, what grades were you in in Long Beach? From what to what? Uh, ninth to twelfth. And how many students were in your ninth grade class? Forty. Like, like 30, 40. 50, 40. Yeah. yeah. Between thirty and forty. But I mean, I I, I didn't think that there was a, I didn't think there was a problem with the funding. You know, I think I thought that the problem I, was I second that. We you had know, one of your questions a, was about the money. We got the money. We got to yeah. stop throwing it away. Yeah, well, we so had a, a 40% right dropout rate. 40%. I mean, it was ridiculous, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, and there's no excuse for that. You already went to school from kindergarten all the way up to 11th grade. Why are you going to drop out now? You've got one more year of, of, of school to go. Then you get your college, your so high school. So you're into dis discipline? Well, it is discipline. Uniforms, you know? yes or yeah. no? Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's, really, it's really, like, insulting to those of us that pay taxes. We're paying for you to go to school for 12 years so you can drop out with one more year to go? What's wrong with you, you know? And, and I mean, you know, I mean, I think that you have to, to put some blame on the kids, on the parents, get them to get their acts together, because really, I think the money's there, in my personal opinion, so based what, on what, what I've seen. Yeah. What about dropout rates? I mean, we've heard a big debate about, we, can't, we don't even know what the drop, we, I, have a, I hear that it's 50%, sometimes I hear that it's 20% for this LA Unified, and it, I guess, all depends on how you define it. Maria, what, what? Yeah, there is no definition, and I think every system has its own way of figuring it out. The state says one thing, the school district says another. I think that we're, we're grappling now with some system that we can all agree upon. But I think when you, when you hear these 40 and 50%, 60% dropout, it, it's because they're, they're counting kids that come in as ninth graders. Right. You know, how many ninth graders are there versus how many uh, kids walk across the stage as 12th graders. And in those four years, we know that most kids drop out in the ninth grade and they don't come back, you know, after ninth grade. But that doesn't, you know, LA Unified will tell you, uh, that doesn't mean that they're not finishing their school somewhere else, that they're not in one of the alternative programs or they're not in, you know, some other school district. But it's hard to uh, to track them down because we don't have a system. We don't have a computer that's big enough and, and bright enough to keep track of all these kids, you know. And so that's part of the problem. But I think there's – what we do is we try to – in my – the organization I work with now, we try to stem the dropout problem by working with elementary kids and their parents, right. you know. The more educated the parents are, the more apt the kids are to finish high school. And so we've got undereducated parents all over the city. And I don't think that we've spent enough time or attention on helping parents understand the school system and what their role in that school system should be. Uh, I was working at, a, at an elementary school just last week, and this, is a, a, this was the, the parents that come to the parent center and we're, we're teaching them about what English language learners should know. And we begin by teaching them what a report card looks like. And what, they, what we're finding out is that these parents come from all over the world, they don't know what, a, what a, a GPA is. They don't know that we have a GPA system. We don't know that, see in Mexico you go to school for 10 years. So if your kid drops out at the 10th grade, well, in Mexico they only go 10 years. So they figure that's the end of the line. I mean, they're confused about how this system works, the, the public school system, and, and what does a grade look like, and, and what is this proficient level? They don't know anything. They don't know how to read their state um, report cards. Have you seen the state? Now, all of you got to college. How many of you could interpret those state standardized test scores reports that came to your home? They were mailed to your home. You were in high school in the last five years. And you have to read what the numbers mean and whether you're falling in proficient, below proficient, advanced. You know, it, it's really very complicated for these parents who are just trying to make a, a living. And so I think, you know, we say, LA Unified says we have parent centers, but they're not functional. You know, we only put a three-hour person in there at one of the biggest schools that we work with. They have two people, and they're real proud of it because they have two people. One was a three-hour person, the other was another three-hour person, but one of them doesn't speak English. You know, neither one of them have a high school degree. They come from the community. We pay them, 
you know, what little we can to get away with it, and, and we expect them to train the other parents. And so that's where our organization comes in. So, you know, it is not a simple problem. You can't just blame the board. You can't blame right. the parents. You can't blame the teachers. But it's the, it's the culture of low expectations that just yes, gnaws, it that's is. all the way around. I mean, that's shared by family, kid, kids' peer group, certainly schools. And there's blame to go around, and there's no simple solution. But what's so bothersome is when the system as embodied by these people that I see, like the police officers or the, or the administrators, are okay with it. They're not knocking down these kids' doors. They're not calling the parents late at night. They're not chasing them down the sidewalk. They're just acknowledging them walk away from schooling. And that's got to change. Okay. The dropout, dropout rate cannot be 50%. That means that there's 750,000 kids in LA Unified today, and that 50% of them are going to drop out, you know, it, it just, that can't be right. There's but it's be, more like of a thousand ninth graders at high school X, 500 will walk the stage and get the diploma. And what happened to the other 500? To Maria's point, some are just in jail, some are joined a gang, some are working in the parents' door, some are working taking care of their younger siblings, some got a GED high school equivalency, some moved to another state but didn't tell us and are graduating with honors and going to Yale. So you we haven't. You know, it, it, Did you it, say jail or Yale? Or both. You know what I mean? So it's, why aren't they all here? And, and is there any dropout rate that's acceptable other than zero? No. Is there any murder rate that's acceptable other than, no. so the question is how do you get it down as low as you can possibly get it down? No, there's an acceptable dropout rate of about 5% because things happen, you know, but 50% is just, mm -hmm. Well, the statistic that we just can't get our hands on because of the demographic, people move around transiency. Five years later, when these kids are 23, how many of them have achieved a high school diploma of its equivalency? That's, right. That's what matters. I mean, we've got this sort of factory model in four years in the same place, in the same school. Do you go through our pipeline? Mm -hmm. Lots of kids don't. How many of those are the kids that I see walking away who I have no hope for? versus they moved to another school, they enrolled in a charter school but didn't tell us, they took an online course, mm -hmm. they skipped a year, they're leaving with family back in Mexico. All those kind of churning happens in a city this big with this kind of mobility. And so it's not all, again, the argument to me isn't about the stat. The argument, which is just real clear, is there are six kids in front of Hamilton High School right now, just those yeah. six guys, they're walking away, and but, nobody's doing but anything Mark, about we it. But Mark, we know that high school dropout rates are higher in overcrowded you know, big giant schools, and their and high uh, dropout rates are lower in smaller, more nurturing, you know, schools where they actually miss you. You know, we have kids that that are right. gone and nobody misses them right. because the rosters They're weren't complete. They never really went to class the first day, so they never really got enrolled, and so they're just gone. Yeah. Or the students that were happy you're gone, and I worry about that. If half the kids leave, the school's less crowded. If the worst troublemakers aren't here, there's less disruption. If the lowest performing kids are gone, they're not on my score when, when my score is ranked for my test. The brighter kids are taking the test, the loser kids have gone. And that just bothers, I mean, I understand those dynamics. It just bothers me if our obligation is to serve every kid, whatever the opposite and no kid left behind is, like lots of kids left behind. And the fact that we're okay with it, that's just part of the deal, that's the part that this yeah, when the back, then I'll get Nicole and then Daniel. Um, that's what I was going to focus on, then no child left behind. Um, since that's been implemented, there's been a decline in the CSU system for the uh, potential teachers for the credential program. Um, and there's been a revolving door for administrators. They can't deal with the new rules. Um, and teachers are frustrated because they have to teach to the test. So since things were already horrible before No Child Left Behind, and it's a big issue now. What is LAUSD doing to, I guess, attract teachers, attract administrators, and keep them there? Because a serious issue with having a revolving door of administrators and having teachers who don't want to be there who are on emergency credentials or temporary teachers is that you do have higher dropout rates. You know, they're, like you said, there's overcrowding. Um, there's no connection with the teachers. I've done research and, and spoke to a lot of students, and they're like, well, I've had five teachers this year, so how am I going to pass a standardized test? How am I going to pass the exit exam 
if I haven't been taught any of this material. So is there anything in place that's gonna move us forward? Because it seems like it's been a step back. Well, there's several things in place. And, I, and, and uh, I've been away from LA Unified for two years, but I know that they always have an active recruitment program. Um, and they also have a, uh, like an academy for an in-house academy for new teachers you know, to try to keep them because it, it is true that we lose um, about 50%, what, 30% turnover of new teachers every five years. So, so there's uh, a dropout rate for teachers too. Yes, there is. Teaching is a hard, hard, very hard job. And I think it's romanticized sometimes. And, and I think if you really want to do a good job, you not only have your classroom to worry about, but you also have to know about the community that you're serving. And you have to connect to those kids you know, they say you have to connect to prior learning. Well, you can't connect to prior learning and the students if you don't know them. So you've got to know where their parents, I think, you have to know where your parents, where they live, how they make their living, where they shop. You know, if you've ever, if you really want to know how you're, the, the type of kids that you're teaching, try taking one home. You know, give a, give a ride home some afternoon to a child. You see that they live in the conditions that, you know, you, you, you wonder how they even get to school every day sometimes. Um, some of our kids live in very, very poor uh, conditions. But to getting back to teachers, I think we've had a shortage of teachers for almost 20 years. And, and I think that's going to continue to get even worse because uh, the traditional teachers that we used to have when I was growing up, those were basically women, uh, you know, uh, good-hearted, intelligent women. Uh, for the most part, and now uh, women's professions, you know, if you look at the professional schools, more women are enrolling than men. There are more women in law schools and, and freshman classes than there are men. And so those are the women's we, women we used to attract into teaching, and now they're gone to other professions. So. So um, it's uh, the well, women's movement that's a fault. No, part, the recruiting part, ad, but the recruiting, the, ad, the recruiting ad says come the LAOSD recruiting ad is, be a teacher, you'll be overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. I didn't so see guess that what? Ad. Not too many people answer that ad. I didn't see that ad. You're making that up again. No, it could has be anybody got word. parents who are teachers? <laughs> it could be better worded. Well, I tell would. <laughs> so what percent of teachers are not credentialed? Do you know, Mark? Well, great progress has been made on that front. There was a time where lots of teachers were called emergency credential. The number of teachers who are getting the credential and coming with the credentials is going up. And No Child Left Behind has made progress by holding that statistic out as a key measure for states and districts. You must hire more qualified teachers. And so the district has made uh, progress on that. I think the hardest part is not so much hiring good people. It's keeping good people. Right. And the part that bothers because there will always be kind of earnest people who care, who want to make a difference. And there's something very noble about being a teacher. The, one of the ways that we blow it is we take the brand new teachers who really care, and we say, where could we really get them inducted into the profession and keep them? Well, let's send them to the most difficult, worst, dysfunctional <laughs> environment, because they'll <laughs> love it. So it's hard being a new teacher no matter where you are. It's triply hard if you're going into conditions with so many challenges. But the union kind of seniority rules tilt the game so that veteran teachers have first dibs for the nicer, more affluent communities or higher performing schools. And the rookie teachers who are low on the totem pole get assigned to the neediest, toughest schools. That's just unfair. Those kids need the best teachers. Not to pick on my, my son who's here, he attends school, as I said, in Westchester. In his third grade class, those two teachers are award-winning veteran teachers who've been teaching for over 20 years. And he gets them. And he comes from a family that brings certain assets already to the table. You look at the kid at Miles Avenue or 103rd Street School or 112th Street School or City Terrace Elementary, they get a rookie who's well-meaning but just is trying to figure out how to be a teacher. And then we go, hmm, why are the scores higher in the affluent community with the super duper veteran teachers and lower in the needier communities that we're giving rookie teachers? So my proposal, which I've said for a long time, is to free up Title I money, which is the federal money that flows to the neediest schools, and allow them to use their Title I money to pay teachers in those schools like a $10,000 differential. 
because I think if you offered a $10,000, something like that, bump up in salary, great teachers will have an incentive to think twice. Historically, the teacher union fights that. They'll, uh, they'll support a little teeny differential, like $2,000. Absolutely. But nobody drives all across town to the poorest areas for $2,000. When you get up to $10,000, then they say, well, all teachers deserve more money. <laughs> so we're stuck on this fundamental equity issue, which is why do the neediest kids get the least prepared teachers? And that, to me, is a huge part of the macro achievement problem is that we're not putting our best resources on the problem. We're leaving it to rookies who care so much, who spend money out of their own pocket, but they burn out. It's so damn hard and so emotionally draining that God bless them. But after two or three years, it's like, I tried it. I can't, I'm drowning here. I'm not getting support. The issues are too overwhelming. I'm going to go do something else. And then we hire another teacher and another teacher. So we've got constant churning in the lowest performing schools that need the help and long-term stability of career veteran award-winning master teachers serving the kids who have more advantage to begin with. And, and I, I know why those teachers want to be there. We've got to give them a reason to go where they're most needed. And until we unlock that equity issue, I think a lot of this in terms of the low achievement issue is just like you can't threaten schools to get better just by we'll punish you or else or else or else or else. Okay, what you need are great teachers, and they're not in the places that we need them. Okay, we're going to take all the last questions okay. right now. Absolutely. So we're going to get Daniel, Nicole, anybody else who wants to ask a question, we'll ask it right now, and then we'll uh, uh, proceed to the responses. Daniel. Sure. Um, I know a lot of attention is focused on uh, elementary school and high school, but what about middle school, which seems to be like teachers actually don't want to teach in middle school, <laughs> and more than, like, I know that's pretty true of, like, many of you. I think that's what, like, t most teachers say that that's the worst place to start is in middle Wait, school. Wait, hold on. Let's go with that assumption. Maria, is that true that most people don't want to teach in middle school? Uh, well, I didn't. I taught one year in middle school, and I said it's either murder or suicide. Right, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but about 10 years later, I came back as the principal of that school. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have a very special person who really wants mm -hmm. to teach in a middle school. And I think um, middle school kids are going through so many things. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're not little kids, but they're not, you know, uh, full teenagers yet. Uh, their hormone, hormones are just going nuts, and, and, and parents don't know what to do with them. I mean, I, I did a lot of counseling of parents, you know, and, and then my kid became a middle school kid. <laughs> I thought I had perfect kids. If there was ever a place to push for class size reduction that would first, be. it would be in these middle schools. Because right now it's first grade, second grade, third grade, and then kaboom, 40 in a class, well, and 45. I also, but in these middle schools, it's, it's, it's out of control. And if you want to get good teachers, and this, you've got to cut these sizes down to where the teachers can, can do their job. And we also have to expose them to a lot of activities, right. you know, and, and we're not doing that. I mean, the, the arts have dwindled down to almost nothing. We have Music traveling. Music programs. Well, you know, in my school, we started a mariachi program, okay? We started one little group, and we had two violins. I got one from the Penny Saver, which is a newspaper out in the valley, and the other one, some parent donated. So we started with those two, because that's all we had. That's not much of a mariachi well, program. I need a lot of... Uh, <laughs> but, but... Where the that, horns. Huh? But you should see what happened to those kids when they got into it, you know, because then the teacher, of course, also had band, and he also had a jazz band. I mean, he was just a, a wonderful... He's still there today. Those kids stayed together, and we had one little... I remember Fernando. His two brothers were in prison. He showed up in a little gang outfit, you know, and Miss Russ, I won't be in the band. I said, I'm not like that, you're not. I said, don't you have a clothes? Put on the said, uniform. He didn't know what was wrong with his clothes. This was the only clothes he had. This is the only way he knew how to dress. And so that wonderful music teacher is really a father figure. So anyway, what happened was we had that original group. Now we've got dozens of, of mariachis juveniles in the valley. And... I, I went to an opening of a supermarket last weekend, a Vallarta out where I live, and they were some of the guys that I started with who were 11 years old are now, one of them is a graduate of MIT, one of them is a, is a graduate of UCLA, one of them went to US, uh, USC, and another went to, a couple went to Cal State uh, Northridge, because that's where we live. And I wish they could have a sign because they were playing for this Vallarta market, you know? 
and all of the So what am I doing? Went to MIT and all I can do is bariatri that by after market? No, no, but I think our <laughs> kids need they job. need role models. They need to know the people that were shopping should should know that this came out this this music. You know, these kids were not just street kids who were playing an right. instrument that day. But they had gone on, they, what help, happens with these groups, and this happened with the MESA group, all these mentoring groups, probably most of you got mentored and are here today because, you know, of group and, and your peers who kept you going and stayed on the right course and you took the same classes. And this is what happens when you have positive role models and groups going on at the schools. Rudin had this attitude, I'm just not going to take this. We, we, um, the, when he became mayor, um, there were still a lot of uh, music classes and instrument classes in the schools. And during the summer, all the instruments would come back to the central office or for cataloging and cleaning or whatever. Okay. To distribute in September when the school season, it would take him five months to get the instruments out. So we're, that's ridiculous. So we sit, we sit around, four people, and say, well, what should we do? So Rudin says, well, I'm just going to call these guys over at UPS and see if they'll donate delivering, delivering them second day, all the instruments, which they did, which they did. It's so big, it can't deal with anything. Uh, Nicole, anybody else? Nicole, go ahead. Okay, I have kind of two totally unrelated questions. First one, there's, I just, in the media, there's been a lot of push lately for, like, preschool education and preschool funding. Do you think that that money should go to that and that should be a focus or it should go to the other parts of the school. And the second question I have is, okay, UTLA obviously can mobilize a lot of people. It has a lot of money and it's very important in LA politics, but do you think that the teachers union has become way too political for its own good? Okay, a anybody else? Last chance to ask a question. Anybody, we don't wanna leave anybody out with a burning question. All right, so let's end with those two. Preschool, UTLA too powerful. They have yeah. something in common. Um, well, I'm a big believer in investing in kids, particularly from less advantaged families, really from prenatal through age three and certainly preschool. The gaps among three-year-olds between those and families where the vocabulary is being fostered and those who are not is unbelievable. There's some new, for those of you who are interested in that kind of research, that how families interact with kids as a function of their own socioeconomic status and their own family education varies dramatically across different families. And some kids are being talked to and engaged in fostering their development of their vocabulary beginning at birth, and other kids are being left alone because that's, it's almost style. It's, it's not really even valuing. It's just, that's what people know. And their gap at age three is unbelievable. At age five, it's worse. And by third grade, one of them is college bound and one of them is dropout bound. I mean, I'm exaggerating only a little bit, but absolutely, we need to give families who don't have the resources that affluent families have quality early childhood education, and I would start at birth. Three, in the, in the development of a human being, three is not a blank slate. A lot of damage can be done by age three, and a lot of incredible nurturing can be done by, by age three. UTLA has always been a powerful force. In some ways, they're less powerful in the larger world today than they were back in the day when I was involved with them. But because everyone else has abandoned LAUSD for some of the reasons we're talking about, they're like the only ones left standing. So in these elections for school board that are coming up in a couple of weeks, March 6th, you have the mayor who's getting involved for the reasons we discussed and is helping raise money. And then you have UTLA. And like no one else, Joe Citizen's not paying attention. There aren't candidate forums. The media, other than they're so busy with Anna Nicole Smith and Brittany, there's no time to cover Did this. you hear what happened today? It was unbelievable. <laughs> With both of them. Oh, One God. of the advantages of, I work at the Music Center downtown where Disney Hall is and the Dorothy Chandler and all of that. Maybe if you've been there. One of the advantages about working down there, we're across the street from the courthouse. Oh, good. So yesterday, we see all the news vans for the Anna Nicole thing. And today, we see all the news vans at the courthouse for the, for the Brittany thing. Huge. Anyway, so the UTLA voice is important. They've always been politically. I think they're less sophisticated now than they've been in the past, ironically. But they're the only ones left standing in the civic debate. And they have a right to advocate, and God bless them. But they should be one of many voices around the schools, not, in effect, the only voice. And 
So I don't begrudge them for what they do. I begrudge everyone else who's either given up. A lot of the guys who work with Reardon and were so involved with LEARN, which is a whole school reform effort that Reardon really helped start, have become pretty cynical. Um, and Steve knows a lot of the folks I'm talking about. It's like, you'll never fix LAUSD. So we're going to create two charter schools. I'm like, <laughs> Big well, one. yeah, I mean, good, you'll serve like 200 kids, God bless you, but what about the 750,000 kids? And so I just think we need to re-engage civic leadership, and therefore there'll be checks and balances with UTLA fighting for their members, which is their job, but other voices. They shouldn't be the only voice or one of two voices in, in the game. Uh, Maria, preschool? Preschool, uh, the data shows that the kids that, that go to preschool do better and actually do better all their lives. It's not true that they, you know, that everything disappears by grade three. If everything else is in place, that preschool Head Start program, it really works, especially for low-income, uh, disadvantaged kids. And so we really support preschool and a lot of our programs. We have this little program called Read With Me, Lea Conmigo, and it's, it's, it's a simple program, but it's in over about 250 schools, and not only here in LA Unified, but now Chino's asking for it, and Lenox, and other school districts. It's just a little backpack, little miniature, you know, child size, kindergarten, first grade backpack, and preschool, and we put six books in it six books in every backpack and every kid gets one. There's three books in Spanish, if we're dealing with the Spanish community, and three in English. But we also put other ethnic um, type books in there for um, kids who have different needs. And every week, the kindergarten teacher takes, you know, Mark's backpack and gives it to Maria, and Maria's backpack goes to someone else. And so at the end of the school year, they have over 600 books that those little kids have had access to. Now, our, our big challenge is making sure that the parents read those books to those kids every week. So we also train the parents um, on how to read and how to engage kids in language, because it's oral language development at that age uh, and at the early ages. And uh, they come to school without knowing how to speak. I think of, of language as being in a basket. And yesterday we were talking to these parents in, um, in the Hollywood area at one of our schools, and you say, you know, it's all right to, tell, to talk to your kids in your native language. They have to develop language. People don't learn to read in English. They learn to read. You know, it could be in Chinese, could be in Armenian, could be in Spanish. You know, and I think we equate intelligence with English. And you know what? There's a lot of people in the world that don't speak a word of English and are very intelligent. Get out of here. <laughs> All right, let's thank uh, Maria, Mark, and Steve. Are you serious? Steve is very up on this. I watch it. I got five teenagers. Okay. I'm up on it.